Hey, what's going on? It's Doug Cunnington here. and Welcome to The Doug Show. In this episode, I am talking with my friend Dave Young. And Dave and I, we've never actually met in person. We just kind of found each other on Instagram, I think, somehow through like Chick-fil-A. I mean, I'm not sure how we got connected at first, but when I saw him going to Chick-fil-A and getting uh, like chicken biscuits and sandwiches, and it was kind of part of his life, I think. I was like, this guy seems pretty cool. I should talk to him. Turns out he has an online business and we have a lot of other things in common. And in this episode, we talk about books and just have kind of a casual conversation. So Dave's a great guy. We actually like get to know each other a little bit during the conversation. I talk about three books and he talks about three books. So we share some insights and I'll put the list of the books in the description, but I don't wanna just list them out here. So check out the links in the description. And this is kind of like you just sitting in on a conversation that Dave and I are having about books. So thanks to Dave. We'll put links so you could you know, hook up with him on Instagram or wherever you wanna follow him. And we will get to the books now. Hey, what's going on? It's Doug Cunnington here and welcome to The Doug Show. And I have a guest host today, Dave Young. How are you? Good, thanks Doug. And we, uh, we're gonna talk about our three favorite books. And before we get into all the you know, the details of what the books are. We're trying something different. So Dave and I sort of connected on Instagram originally. And um, that's right. And you were on my podcast a while back. And we, you know, I thought we had a nice conversation. And I was like, hey, why don't we just chat some more and talk business stuff? So that's why we're here. And I appreciate you taking the time. So for the folks that don't know you, can you just give a little intro about what you do now and maybe how you ended up where you're at? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, if you want the, the long version, I gave the like full story on your uh, podcast for a while back, but the short version is now I run a company called Drone Launch Academy. Um, we do online courses for commercial drone training. So test prep courses and some other stuff, uh, roof inspections, aerial video and editing, stuff like that. So. If you want to fly drones for money or commercially, we have courses to help you do that. Uh, I've been doing that full time for about a year. Before that, I was doing it on the side for about two years, year and a half. Um, and then during that time when I was working full time, right out of school, I um, started working for the FBI doing accounting stuff. So I worked for them for about eight years total, maybe just a little short of eight years, yeah, before quitting and, and doing this full time. So it's kind of always my dream to have a, my own business and and kind of control my schedule. So um, finally excited that it made it happen after some other questionable uh, side project ideas that I talked to you about on your podcast if people really want to dive into it. But, um, but no, I'm happy you got this idea to kind of chat and looking forward to it. Cool. So um, we do have a, a list. I pick three books. Dave pick three books. And we are going to mention them now, but we're going to do some banter uh, sort of, you know, section of this. So I'll, I'll tell you mine that I picked um, Essentialism, Deep Work, and Power of, of Habit. Um, couple, like a few of my favorite books there, and we'll, we'll highlight some stuff as we go. Uh, Dave, which ones did you pick? Yeah, I picked um, The One Thing by Gary Keller. I don't have it in my office here. It's at my house, actually, next to my bed. I'm rereading that one. I read it a couple years ago. Um, the next was Getting Everything You Can Out of All You've Got, which is a very wordy book title by Jay Abram. Uh, but this is a really good book. I've actually only read half of it, so maybe the last half sucks. I'm not sure. I Probably not. first half was great. Uh, so that's one I picked. And then this one I'm also in the middle of. I kind of have like book ADD. I like rarely finish. I usually just read and then and bounce and I'm like in the middle of like 20 books. Um, but uh, this one is The Ultimate Sales Machine by uh, Chet Holmes. Uh, and I thought this book was going to be all about sales, but it's really about turning your business into the quote ultimate sales machine. So it's got a lot of stuff in here on time management, prioritizing, running teams, hiring, um, you know, marketing, all that stuff. It's, it's really good. Um, so I've enjoyed that so far. He, uh, Chet used to work for Charlie Munger and uh, ran some teams under him. So a uh, good person to learn from, and I'm really enjoying that one so far. So those are my three. Nice. So actually, let's talk about our reading protocol. So you mentioned that you are reading multiple books right now, and you didn't even finish some of the ones um, that we're going to talk about today, which is okay. 
That's it. That's totally yeah. fine. Dave. I, I, I wasn't <laughs> like, Hey, you got to finish it. But, um, I would have maybe three books on that list. If you want to say well, you have finished every page, you know? <laughs> so like, how, how do you approach read? Like you just, actually, I'll just leave it open. How do you approach reading books? It sounds like, you know, you're willing to invest in books. You'll buy them if you get a good recommendation, but like, why don't you finish them? And why are you reading more than one right now? Yeah. Um, I think so. You know, as far as books go, I mean, within reason, if I hear someone recommend a book or say, oh, this is a good book, or um, if I think it's going to be benefit, I mean, really, a book's usually 10 to $15, um, and if you're buying them for business, usually you can expense them or use them to buy them through your business. So I followed Ramit Sethi for a while, and he's like, I don't even question buying a book. I just If somebody says the book's good or I think it's going to help me, I just buy it. You know what I mean? A lot of times people will spend hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars on courses, which that's like one way to learn is really good. But sometimes you can get a lot of the same information from one of those books or things like that. You just have to actually read them and then implement them, which is usually what people have the hard time doing. Um, so I, as far as reading, so, so my kind of philosophy on books is as long as you're not like a brand new business and you're, you're barely even affording to like, you know, pay your $5 for your you know, email address, you know, maybe not a great idea to, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it would be a good investment to buy one good book, but instead of not pulling the trigger on literally every book you, you hear of. Uh, but now, honestly, if my book, <laughs> my wife makes fun of me because it's like, oh, that's a cool book, buy a book. She just, she's like, why don't you finish the books before you buy more books? I'm like, because I don't know when I'm going to be in a situation where I'm going to go, hmm, I need to know that skill now. And I just want to be able to pick it up and absorb it. Um, so, uh, Gotcha. So I, I, I've started as far as like how to how I read books. Um, I actually started setting aside one full day a week now. I just started doing this like two weeks ago. So this is a new thing. So I'm still trying this out. Um, or maybe three weeks. Dedicated only to like self development and learning. So on Wednesdays, I don't do any meetings. I don't do any like real work, you know, on my business per se. Um, all I do are take courses, read books, um, and that's it. And so, um, you know, I've got some, some marketing courses I took and it, it just, it's nice when you can just you block out an entire day. I don't schedule anything I did. I'll do anything other than read books. So tomorrow I've blocked off my entire, ca- entire calendar. Um, I do have a mastermind kind of the first half of that day. Second half of the day, I'm just going to be reading this book the whole time and taking notes for, Hey, how can I implement some of these things and kind of maybe change the way I'm, I'm doing business. Um, so that's kind of my, my go-to. And then at night I usually like to read before I go to sleep, but Sometimes they're not like business focused books, um, but more just kind of like leisure books and things like that. Cool. Yeah. And I, um, I have generally the same philosophy with, with books where I'm like, if it, if it looks pretty good, I'm probably going to buy it. Um, however, I get a lot of stuff from the library and like a lot of the, a lot of the libraries have like ebooks that you can get and like audiobooks and all that stuff. So a lot of times I'll actually read it the first time from the library and then if I really like it, then I'll go ahead and buy it. Um so that's little, probably a much smarter way to go about it. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit cheaper and then what ha- I mean like I still have like just a ton of books um and it takes up space and we've moved a few times in the last few years books are heavy so like it really has to like make the cut i actually have gotten rid of some and then like thinned them down and then i got more and then we moved. so yeah and i typically i will finish one unless i'm like you know what this is actually getting boring or redundant or whatever um yeah. and i i usually have like one like non-fiction fiction book and then one fiction book that i read usually before bed and i read like you know probably 15, 20, 30 minutes, like before bed, usually that fiction yeah. book will like, you know, zap me out. It sounds like you do the same, right? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I usually read it on my Kindle as I'm like lying down on my, the Kindle app on my phone. And I just kind of like yeah. fall, fall asleep that way. You ever hold it upright and then it hits you in the head and you ever done that? <laughs> I, don't, I don't have the arm. I don't have the arm stamina. To do that. I've actually, I thought like, so I've got these glasses over here, actually. Um, a uh, company sent these to me. They're for drones, so you can like see what you're doing. You can see what the drone sees as you fly. But it runs uh, an Android operating system on here. And I've thought about 
seeing if I could download the Kindle app and <laughs> put these on at night so I don't have to hold my arm up and I can just like read. They're almost like Google Glasses a little bit. But um, I haven't I haven't tested that out yet. But that would be a game changer. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Those look really slick, by the way. <laughs> they, look, they should be at Star Trek. They're not that slick. Nice. Um, so one one thing I wanted to ask you. So you you have like an accounting background, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you worked at the FBI doing accounting stuff, right? Like forensic uh, something or other, right? Yeah, I did that for a few years, and also did some like internal forecasting, budgeting stuff too. Okay. Not so sexy. Yeah. Yeah. So. That does sound kind of boring, you know, it's accounting and all that stuff, and it sounds corporate-y in some mm -hmm. way, um, but yeah, it was. Here, here's a question. So I, did you watch uh, Ozark, or are you familiar with I started. Show? I've seen a couple episodes of it. Yeah. Okay. So as someone who knows nothing about accounting, I'm like really fascinated with like money laundering and stuff, especially with uh -huh. the shows that we see on TV. So like, uh, did you watch Breaking Bad? How about that? I did. Oh yeah, yeah. I okay. love that. I love the show. So, like, can you can you just do like a quick tutorial on money laundering, or or what <laughs> what can you mention here? I mean, um, <laughs> money <laughs> tutorial on like how to money launder one hundred and one. Yeah, is it like I mean, accurate? Like where you have like uh, like in Breaking uh, Bad the way they laundered money? I mean, that's you can. I mean, there's different ways to do it. Um, there's actually the any AML, any money laundering, you know, any money, I don't know, AMA. There's an association for any money, any money laundering. Um, but, uh, but they, I mean, you can go on there and they show you all the different ways you can do it. I mean, you can run it, you can run it through a business, um, where you know, that's like, that's what they do on Breaking Bad, right? It's like the car wash, they clean it by like, uh, you know, running a bunch of fake car wash sales, which you can figure out by watching that the car wash isn't that busy. Um, a lot of the stuff that I worked on while I was there wasn't quite as like large scale sophisticated. Um, they did a lot of, they did a lot of that stuff, but it was more, so money laundering, people think of money laundering as like cleaning the money, but technically money laundering can be anytime you're transacting with illegal uh, funds. You know what I mean? So you rip someone off, you, you know, or you, or you sell, you know, so you sell a ton of drugs and you have a million dollars. If you transfer that million dollars to anyone, um, that's technically like money laundering. You're moving illicit proceeds. Um, so on a technical, like what they can charge you with, like they'll charge people with money laundering all the time, even though they're not like owning a car wash and washing the money and doing all the cool, like Hollywood stuff. Um, now if you got like these people who are trying to, you know, make it look like legitimized income, then that's kind of what you'd see there. Or um, you can do like, they'll do um, trade-based money laundering, which is where they'll like, uh, you know, you're buying goods from someone, but they'll like way overpay for the goods. That way, you know, similar to how like you're like running it through the business where it looks like a very legitimate transaction, uh, but it's, it's there, there's some not so good stuff going on in there. Okay. And that's all stuff you can find like on that website. So that's not cool, like insider knowledge. Because I signed a stack of papers about this big when I left. I don't remember what I signed. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm just gonna leave it at that. That's that's what I expected. So yeah, we'll stop recording, and you can give me all the inside tips. Then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, sure, you bet. <laughs> so let's get into the books here, and um, maybe we'll come back to some of that money laundering stuff later, but probably not. So, okay. So let's start with the, the first one that you mentioned, uh, Dave, the one thing, which I, I actually have the book here. It's a great book. I've read oh, it nice. myself. It's out of focus, but it's a great book. And what, what was like your one or two main takeaways with it? I mean, they make it pretty clear the point of the book, right? The one thing is to focus on like the one thing and you can't have multiple priorities because a priority is like one thing, right? And I think that's one of my biggest problems and is evident in my book reading, right? Is like, and it's just my personality. I get excited about something. I go, I start doing it. I'm like, oh, this is cool, it's cool. As soon as you get some resistance or like kind of the initial interest and like spark wears off, it's hard to have that motivation to like keep going on something until it's finished. Um, and I also listen to Seth Godin a lot and read some of his books, but he always talks about like, you know, it's basically worthless until it's like shipped. So like, unless your idea is actually done and whatever your project you're working on is finished, like, 
you might not you might as well not even have worked on it at all right like if i record like if i if i want to release a blog article that and i write three-fourths of it but i never publish it like i just have wasted all that time um so i'm trying to be better about uh not creating so many projects based on like oh these are cool ideas let's start doing them um but like cool i can think about all these ideas write them down but then i need to like pick some and focus on them and only do those like until it's done and then you know kind of another thing i picked up was always tackling and i've heard other people say this too but um it's tackling the hardest thing first right schedule it first thing in the morning block off time for it um, don't just assume that it's going to get done like say cool here's what i'm here's what i need to do like on this most important project and you know i can ignore basically everything else that can be ignored and only focus on that until it's done and um actually read that book right before I started working on Drone Launch Academy. And I remember when I was initially setting up like the first website, I knew the trickiest part for me at the time, which sounds stupid now, was like figuring out this stupid Squarespace form that I had to fill out, that I had to set up where people could fill out this form because I needed all this information to help them with their FAA paperwork. And I'm like, okay, I know this is going to be the most complicated part for me to try to figure out what information I need, how to set it up. So like, I'm going to do that part first. And I remember like, thinking about that because I just read that book and I and I just like, stayed focused on that one task until it's finished um, and then like, everything else becomes a lot easier from there right? um, so I'm just trying to apply that you know I can't say that I've always applied that right going forward you kind of forget about that and it's easy to be distracted by all these little things and emails and small projects and all that and things seem ur- important because they feel urgent but um, now I just try to say look at an item hey is this really going to impact my life or business on like a in like a substantial way like if not figure out what what's the next thing i can look at that might you know so um that's the kind of rubric i'm trying to remind myself to like evaluate things with got it and i think there is even a line in the one thing it's something like if you do this task does it make other tasks easier or like make them unnecessary at all so like yeah, it yeah. really like drives home and like all right, is like figuring out that form, which it sounds like that was pretty critical, right? Like that's the starting point for anyone that any customer that was coming your way, like you had to have right. that, right? Other stuff probably didn't matter as much or you could figure out later. So um, yeah, yeah, I, I love the book as well. Um, and I will segue gently to essentialism, which I think that's the one I mentioned, and I have this yeah. blur going on. Um, so I'm going to get rid of that so I can actually show. So essentialism, you'll notice like the similarity in the, you know, simple black and white cover. And then you have like, didn't the they red, come out around the same time too? Roughly. Yeah. Roughly yeah. the same time. So I read the one thing first and it was good. It was like, I found it, you know, interesting and effective and all that stuff. Um, and it was, it's by, Gary Keller and Jay Papazan, and then Greg McEwen wrote Essentialism, and I feel like they have like really similar like points that they're trying to make. Um, mm-hmm. But for whatever reason, I enjoyed Greg McEwen's like writing style, which I read this one second, and I was like, oh wow, I enjoyed this more. And I think it could be, um, I think isn't Gary Keller like. Keller Williams, like the yeah, real, real estate. estate yep. So do you have any family or close friends in the real estate game? Um, not really. I mean, I know people in real estate, but I wouldn't say my family or close friends. Okay. So I'm not a huge fan of real estate folks. That's why, <laughs> why I asked that. I mean, like <laughs> on a personal level, I'm sure they're fine and everything. Yeah. But like when you, when you are working with real estate folks, for me, it's basically like working with a used car salesman. I'm like, do I believe like real, like anything? Really hypey. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't believe anything they're telling me, and uh, or or like a mortgage broker or whatever. I'm like, they're doing transactions. Mm-hmm. Like they are making mistakes along the way. I, I, you bought a bunch of places, right, or a few homes in the past, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And like, did you ever get <laughs> small rent? I've done a lot. I mean, I bought my home, and then I'm in the process of a, a triplex here. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Like their their paycheck is based on deal flow. Yeah, deal flow. And then their, I mean, you have an accounting background. Numbers matter and stuff. And like every transaction I've been a part of, like 
or have even heard about someone's like, yeah, the mortgage company or whoever the closing company sent me something. They need it tomorrow because we're closing in two days and they messed up on some, uh, you know, number. Happened right? to me. Yep. I was reviewing it and I was like, this doesn't seem, this doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem like the number. Oh yeah. Sorry. We used this other thing and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, it got, got yeah. messed up. It had to like recalculate every time i've never talked to anyone and asked that question where they were like yeah they nailed the spreadsheet work they always screw it up so anyway that is beside the point <laughs> um so gary keller is a real estate guy and real estate folks are a little more salesy than like my background so when i read it i was like oh this is good but after i stepped away and read it again, I was like, ah, it's a little too salesy, a little too much for me. The points are good. The one thing is a fine book, but uh, yeah, like oh, the yeah. tone was a little bit off for me. So gotcha. essentialism. Yeah, it's I like funny. That. I hadn't, I haven't read all of essential. I think I started it, but um, I had a, another friend who did the same thing. He recommended the one thing to me and then he read essentialism and he's like, oh man, this book's incredible and blah, blah, blah. He really liked essentialism a lot more. So. Yeah, and, and it's like it's ba it's the same points in in so many ways. It's like you got to focus on fewer things, and things will be better. You know, that's like yeah. the main idea. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. So both of those are those are awesome, and I'm gonna jump over to the power of habit, which is uh, like one of my favorites. Charles Duhigg is a like really good writer, so he'll have. Um, and in fact, he writes for the New York Times or uh, I can't remember. Anyway, the point is he'll have like um, like an anecdote, a story where he's like done deep research and then he'll come back and like make the point with like scientific information and references and studies. Um, and I found that like a lot more interesting than some of these softer books, like e even some of the classics, like, uh, what is it? Think and grow rich, right? Like w mm -hmm. one of the super referenced, uh, books out there. And that one's just like really soft. There's no real, um, like references in there. It's just someone <laughs> yeah, persuading yeah. you to do something. I'm yeah. like, that doesn't sound quite right. Like maybe it's right, but like <laughs> that doesn't sound right to me. How do I know? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, did, did you read the power of habit? You said not. Uh, I did. I listened to it on audiobook. I haven't, so I haven't physically read it, but I was, sure. we were painting our house and it was, we put it on the speakers and we we're listening to it. Okay. Do you remember much, uh, you know, from it or any? Yeah. Yeah. I remember the story. I, it was super interesting to listen to because he'd have, really intriguing stories where you're just like, Hmm, I wonder why that happened. And then he would go back and explain, uh, like how your mind is programmed and how it works. Yeah. It was, it was really, really fascinating. Cool. And I found, um, so one that that's super interesting, but like, it's very effective to like implement. And in fact, in this book and in Charles Duhigg's other like New York times bestseller, smarter, faster, better, in the back, there is like a 15 page, let me find it. There's like a 15 page, like how to implement what we talked about here. So oh, that's nice. Yeah. And it's like, it's short and it's actionable. And it's like, you can just read that part. Obviously it helps to, you know, read the whole <laughs> to read book. The the but I found it like effective to like, I, I enjoy beer. I drink beer pretty often. And like, I think I was just like, you know what? I want to like stop drinking for a month, which probably is easy for a lot of people. But, you know, for me, I drink, <laughs> drink often. I drink beer pretty often. So like it was very key to like approach it in sort of a systematic way. So in this specific case, and I'll just give the example, like I would have a, a beer in the evening with my wife during dinner, um, watching TV and we were like, we needed to replace it with something. There were multiple triggers for it. So it was like mm -hmm. the time of day, get rid of stress. You're around the same people in the same environment around the same time. So all these triggers. So even if one of them was gone, like I would still have like, Oh, I should grab a beer. Yeah. And time for a beer. Yeah. Yep. So instead of like grabbing a beer, I was like, when any, of any of these triggers happen, I'm going to get like a, like a bubbly water, right? So mm. it's a decent like representation. It's cold. It's, it's carbonation. Fizzy. Yeah. 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 It, um, but it like 
satiated that uh, like urge at that time from all those triggers. And yeah, so a couple of years ago, I haven't done this in a while, but like a couple of years ago, like didn't drink for a full month, lost like, you know, 10 pounds of fat. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and then I was fine. And then I couldn't wait to, you know, have a beer at the end of the month. But, but you I did mean, it? Yep, I did it. It was, it was like not That's a big great. deal, like uh, just to get it done. So um, Power of Habit, very good. Definitely a read now. Yeah, yeah. It's like one of the more interest, like helpful, but also super interesting books. Next on your list, um, how about that? Getting Everything You Can mm. Out of All You Got um, by Jay Abraham, if I remember right. Yeah, or I think, yeah, A. Abram, J. Abram. So if you don't like hypey, I don't know if you've ever read this, but so it's it's definitely like a marketing book, you know what I mean? Um, incredible cover design, too. Huge. <laughs> I'm like, I think it was written in uh, Microsoft Word 97, maybe. Um, but uh, it's, I, I found it, if you can, yeah, if you can get past kind of the, some of the hypey marketing speak, um, it's just as far as like positioning your company and the psychology of why people buy or don't buy and how to remove objections and how to offer the right things to get people to like be motivated, how to, um, and it's not like a, Hey, how to trick people into buying your stuff. Right. But it's like how to make sure you're offering what people really, really want and how to then communicate that to them. One great story that in here that I remember, and I should have flagged it, uh, beforehand but it's it's talking about people don't necessarily always want the cheapest thing um they want the thing you know usually with the most value and if you can communicate that so one of the stories that i really liked and that i remembered was like let's say a little girl wants a pony right and her dad's out pony shopping and why they picked pony i don't know but um one guy says cool i'll sell you this pony it's 200 dollars, right and that was it all right here's your pony 200 bucks and then the dad went to another guy and said, hey, I've got this pony here. It's $350. But I don't want you to pay me for the pony right now. What I want to do is I want to bring the pony to your house personally. I'll bring it there. Uh, I'll bring it into your barn. I'll set up the barn for you. I'll show you how to lay the straw. I'll show you the kind of food it eats. I'll help your daughter um, like ride it around, how to put the saddle on if you saddle ponies. I don't know. Uh, put the saddle on. I'll come out every week. I'll change out the bedding. I'll make sure it's cared for uh, and make sure that you guys are comfortable with it and that you're enjoying it. At the end of the month, uh, if you really, really like the pony, you can pay me $350 and you'll be all set. Um, if not, I'll take the pony back, no cost to you. He's like, who do you think sold the pony? You know, uh, So it's saying like it's not necessarily that. The cheapest one always wins, unless you're in something that's totally commoditized and you can't break that commodity. Um, but usually... That's not the case. Usually you might think you're in something like, oh, this is just a commodity business. It's a race to the bottom. But there's always something you can do to stand out and be different and do something to give more value to people where you can justify um, you know, selling for a higher price and that person gets a lot more value. They remove a lot of the risk, right? Because the first guy to buy the pony, but the pony you know, dies two days later, they're out 200 bucks. Whereas you know, they're willing to kind of pay extra for that comfort and more like hand-holding of it. So I thought that was really cool. Um, yeah, just a story to kind of illustrate that. And, there, and there's stories like that all throughout the book um, that have been really helpful. And I've actually, I just sat down with this with a notebook. And every, as I was, re if you if you have a business or a side project or something, and you like read through a book like this, you will instantly like be triggered to think about like, oh, I could do this. Oh, I could do this. And so like I always say, I like I always when I have a book like this, I sit down with a notepad too. And anytime I have an idea like that, I write page 42 and then I write down whatever idea that came into my head and then I keep move on and I keep reading and then at the end or like end of the week or whatever I can review my notes and figure hey is there anything I might actually want to implement now um, one thing we implemented I might have talked about this in my podcast with you all back but they talked about like um, risk reversal and then doing something beyond risk reversal and that's basically how can you remove all the risk in the transaction for the customer so people usually think like Oh, money back guarantee. If you don't like it, I'll give you your money back. So that's kind of, that's risk reversal. But he said, if, you, if you're if you confident enough in your product where you're able to offer it beyond risk reversal, where actually if the person doesn't like whatever it is, they're actually coming out on, they, they're actually gaining something. Um, so I was thinking about that. And like I mentioned before, we have the test prep course and we already, everybody is kind of standard that like, hey, if you, if you don't pass the test, we'll give you your money back. 
Um, but we said, hey, if you don't pass the test, we'll give you your money back, but we'll also reimburse you the testing fees that you pay to the testing center, which isn't even paid to us. So if they, so if they fail, we're out 150 bucks. So they re refund from their money and we pay them 150 bucks. Um, and as soon as we did that, oh, that's something different. So other little, like some blogs started writing about that. I mean, they were affiliates also, but it gave them like more, like something new to write about. Um, it was just different, right? And it gave people a lot more comfort level and um, our sales went up like pretty significantly after that. And I knew that based on past refund history that not a lot of people failed. So I knew it was like not gonna be, like, like put us out of business, you know what I mean? Um, but anyway, so yeah, I've, just, I've gotten some really good ideas from this book. And like I said, I'm only half done, um, but, uh, but I'm planning on making this one of my Wednesday uh, read-throughs. Nice. That's pretty cool, yeah. Like, I, I have heard of that book, um, and I think, like, generally, I can make it through, uh, like, some of the sales <laughs> hypey stuff. You're I mean, not in the dark, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I write stuff like that sometimes, too. So, like, I'm not... You know, I'm not immune to it, and I could learn something from <laughs> from reading something like that. So, okay, interesting, very interesting. Now, what else do we have on the list here? I lost my spreadsheet. Yeah, deep work was another deep one of yours. Work, nice. Have you read that one? I have. That's a great book. That's the one I read all the way through, start to finish. <laughs> nice. So this is another one. Um, it's by Cal Newport, by the way, and this is another one where. I think like I just particularly enjoy his writing style and there's yeah. a lot of scientific sort of uh, references and or at least like some external references like when I picked up well, he's this, a he's a professor too so that helps with like the recent yeah yes yeah yeah exactly yeah he's a great writer and um, like the biggest takeaways for me on on that um, especially uh, I guess I'll just say it so this is also referenced in the one thing and it's like working in time block. So in the one thing they're like, mm -hmm. work on the hard thing, like for the first 30 or whatever, 90, three hour, 90 minutes to three hours of your day. So you like get through, it. through. Um, like uh, in deep work, he's like time block, you are probably gonna get a lot more done. And actually for me, when I first started working for myself, um, or at least the side projects I had a full time gig. So in the morning, it would take me a little while to like get in the mode. And I actually started waking up super early so I can get about two hours in before I started my day job. And um, yeah, very effective for me to like know what I was going to work on, have the like whatever research or preparation done ahead of time so I could sit down and like do the deep work assuming it would potentially take like 30 to 45 minutes to like get in the right mode, especially if I'm writing, it takes me mm -hmm. a while to like, you know, stretch out the writing muscle and then like actually get some good yeah, stuff get, out. It's a flow. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. What, what were your takeaways from deep work? No, it's, it's, it's funny. You mentioned, what I was going to say about the, the two things. So when I had my, had my company going as a side project, I would, I don't really love waking up early in the morning, so I would try to work on it at night. Um, another thing that was that I got, this is kind of pulling from the one thing actually, talk about how your willpower is not on will call. You know, like you can't just summon willpower anymore. Like your your willpower is, is limited by um, how much like kind of mental taskings you're, you have going on during the day. Um, and so I found it's much more difficult when I work a full day of work then I get home and I think I worked like nine hour days because I would take off every other Friday, which is good because then I could focus on that. But oftentimes when I was off, my wife wanted me to just hang out with her rather than do more work. Um, but but I work a nine hour day, nine, nine or ten if you count like lunch and stuff. Come home, eat dinner, you know, and then I had kids at the time, a couple small kids, so I'd like hang out with my kids, put them to bed at eight o'clock, and then it's like, cool, now it's time to like dive in. And then by that point, you're just kind of like, oh, I'm done. You know what I mean? I was spent. Uh, so I started doing what you said you did. I started saying, well, what if I do kind of give my best hours of the day? Because I'm, I'm going to be at work anyways. I can't just be like, oh, I've worked six hours, but I'm not feeling like it anymore, so I'm just going to go home. Like, you're not going to do that. You know what I mean? So I woke up earlier, and I think I spent from like seven to nine working on my side project in the morning. And then I would go from like 9.30 to six or whatever it was um, in my job or maybe – maybe even seven sometimes. I don't know how many hours that works out to. Um, but I found I got a ton more done when I started doing that because when you wake up, you're kind of like, 
obviously it takes a little bit to get it, but then I'd, I would go out somewhere, I'd get some breakfast, I'd sit down, I'm like, cool, I got two hours to lock in, what am I going to get done now? And it makes you a lot more like hyper-focused because you know, okay, cool, I got two hours, this is basically all I've got for today, like what am I, what am I tackling, you know? Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I really, I really like that. And also, yeah, just like you said, I found that block enough chunks of time to be able to really like get into something, especially if it's going to take some more mental manpower. Um, it's just, that's really, really important. And after I read that book, I actually convinced my wife to let me go on like a weekend retreat by myself to just like, cause I, I was still working full time. I was like, I really just need to knock out like these chunk of things, you know? So can I just get like one weekend to myself to just like knock it all out? And she's like, sure, that's fine. Uh, Cause again, we got small kids. So I'm leaving her alone with all the kids for the weekend. So I just went to like a bed and breakfast by myself kind of in the middle of nowhere. And I just worked on all that stuff all weekend. Uh, and just, kind of got it knocked out so that was um so that was cool to do and, and yeah it's it's effective so i really enjoyed the book. I actually sent that book to a friend of mine for as a birthday gift i liked it so much i don't know if you even read it but i was like this is a great book you should read it <laughs> nice yep and that that's actually pretty cool you did the weekend retreat thing i mean you hear writers do that sometimes they're like i gotta finish this edit or whatever and then they like disappear go to a hotel and just like don't have to worry about stuff they're out of their normal environment they're at a place yeah. where like you're only doing the thing that you went there to do so yep yep very cool all right last one on the list right um or have we done yes. the ultimate sales machine yet okay i don't think we did i mean i talked about it a little bit at the beginning ultimate sales machine much better looking cover if we're rating covers here than uh, getting everything you can. It actually looks like it was designed this uh, this decade, which is good. Um, yeah, so um, I'm not super far into this book, um, but I'm already really enjoying it. Get some nuggets out of it. I'm I've listened. I was listening to the audiobook while I was driving, uh, but I'm gonna actually go through and, and reread the parts I listen to, just because sometimes you you end up passively listening and not super engaging. So I'm gonna sit down and, and quickly read back through what I listened to and take some notes. Um, but one thing I really enjoyed is, you know, he, the first chapter is on like time management and how to focus. So it's a lot of, it's several things related to kind of like the one thing. Um, but another area that I thought was cool is that, um, identifying like core areas of your business that are like, that really drive the results of your business. Right. So whether it's, you know, there's customer service, there's product development, there's, you know, what are the kind of, pillars that make your business good and make it profitable and run well. And then dedicating one hour each week to determining like, what are the next steps on this? Where can we improve? Like, what do we need to be doing in this area to get better at it? And especially if you have a team, that's when you're meeting with your team on those areas. And I was kind of doing this in some aspects of the business. So I have a weekly meeting for customer service. So two people that handle customer service for me, we meet for one hour a week go over, hey, is there any problems? What are you guys hearing on the phone calls? Um, any issues we need to address, stuff like that. Any improvements? So we were, we were kind of doing that in the customer service arena. Uh, similarly, I was doing that in like, for the, we have, I have one girl that helps me recruit new affiliate partners and do promotions and things like that. So I had that, that meeting. But there are other areas that I know are really important that I was kind of like, oh yeah, I'll kind of work on those when I get a chance or that I would just kind of neglect them. So for instance, like SEO and content creation and kind of making sure our website is as optimized as it can be for that kind of stuff. I kind of neglected some of that. My paid advertising, I would check with my paid advertising guy, kind of like haphazardly, but it wasn't super like structured. Um, and he was saying in this book, the reason he was doing that was mostly because like during the day he was getting bombarded by people just walking in. He called them like uh, got a minute meetings where people were like, hey, you got a sec? And they talked to him about something. I don't necessarily have that problem because everybody's remote that I work with, right? So like all remote, uh, contractors or employees um so i don't have a problem with people like bombarding me if they're trying to hit me up on slack i just set my computer to do not disturb and then i can work on what i need to work on and then i'll turn it off and answer messages so i don't necessarily have that issue but it does help you say cool here's a dedicated time where we're going to look at this area or issue and only this and we're going to make a plan and we're going to figure out who's doing what maybe it's me and i need to block off some other time maybe it's them and i can set some deadlines and hold them accountable for it but this way we know here's the plan, here's who's responsible, and like here's how we move forward, and it's always like getting addressed. Um, so I really liked that kind of more structured, methodical approach to like making sure each area of the business is not being forgotten, you know? Gotcha. And would you say the book is more oriented towards like um, people with existing profitable businesses to like 
work out some of the, you know, I guess, waste and make sure that they're paying attention or? Well, I mean, so far it sounds like they talk in the book like, oh, if you were a sales manager or if they kind of try to relate it to like, oh, you can do this if you're an employee as well or employee or a, a manager. But it sounds like it's mostly aimed at people who are running their own business. Um, I think there it gets more into like um, marketing and sales and stuff like that later on in the book. So I could maybe uh, address some of that in a later one. But the first half of the book seems to be like optimizing your structure and your ineffectiveness at managing yourself and managing other people and tasks. You know, I think they're kind of trying to lay the foundation with that and then um, then kind of bring in some more of the like sales and marketing tactics after that. Gotcha. That's my that's my impression. I don't know. I'll, I'll give you the update when I get further through it. <laughs> cool, cool. And I think um, one, one thing I'll mention kind of going back to like how we read books and like your approach. Um, so I'll pick up I'll pick up a book like if it looks good. But one thing that I've I've done is um, actually let's rewind just a little bit more. So I used to not read very much like at all. I would read like some beer brewing books or maybe if I had like a particular interest in something, I would I would read like nonfiction generally. And then like a few years ago, I was sitting with my like brother-in-law, one of his buddies are both like PhDs. So these guys are way smarter than me, more dedicated. <laughs> and I was like, you know, how often do you like, or how many books do you guys read um, in a year, would you say? So the one, one guy was like oh, about 15. I was like, man, I haven't read like 15 books in like the last 15 years. And then, uh, and I knew my brother-in-law read a lot and he was like, eh, probably like 50 or 60. Right. So let that sink in. Right. So it's like he, and he's crushing books. Right. So he's like yeah. reading more than one per week and they're not like small books. So I was like, man, I, I should, I mean, these guys are smarter than me. I should probably read a little bit more. And then I slowly started reading a little bit more from like, maybe one or like zero to two books a year to like, I think I read like 14 and then like maybe 30. And then maybe a couple years ago, I read like maybe even two years straight, I read 50 or more books in the calendar wow. year. Yeah. I, I finished them, Dave. No, no. I was just saying, <laughs> if you're talking about books started, I probably would be you're talking about books finished. You got me beat. Yeah. So I, I was reading a bunch and then I was like, Oh, hold on a second. Am I, am I like implementing stuff or am I just like getting pumped and like running around a little bit too much? And then I was like, should I reread some of these? Like there's more than like, you know, one good point in the power of habit. Maybe I should reread it. And if I could just get like one excellent like thing that I actually do from say deep work, for example, and I like time block stuff, like it changes mm -hmm. every, everything after that. So I was mm -hmm. like, maybe I should go back and reread some of these that I know are good because I forget stuff, you know? Um, yeah. so anyway, that's sort of my, my approach. And at this point I'm sort of rereading, I'm not pulling in as many new ones. I mean, there's so many books out there that are essentially regurgitated stuff. Like you probably see the same references, like actually in the one thing, essentialism, the power of habit, like they reference some of the same exact, um, journal study. So have you seen that yeah. too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, people love the marshmallow study thing. I hear about that in almost every book I read. <laughs> Anything about like self-control or willpower or delayed gratification. I mean, it's always, there was a study where, you know, you put a marshmallow in front of a five-year-old and, you know, so. Yeah. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about that as I'm like reading a little bit less and maybe even reading like a little bit more fiction and like letting my brain rest a little bit instead of like bombarding yeah. it with like new ideas, like too much. Right. Um, so anyway, just there's approaches for everything. And like some people read a ton and I think it's, um, I think it's probably like up to the individual and how much time you have and like how you want to try to do stuff in a book or not. I mean, some people just want to get the idea and just keep going. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know for me, I'm like, if I'm going to read something, unless it's just purely reading for like entertainment, like the power of habit one was almost like that was just really entertaining to me. You know what I mean? So I could like listen to it and be like, Oh cool. This was entertaining. Served its purpose. But if I'm reading something to like, Hey, I want to learn new skills and be a better business owner and all those things. Right. Like I think for those, it's almost, it's like better to go slow and to like take notes and write down ideas. 
Um, and then just like maybe take some time to implement it before you start uh, trying to set records for how many books you're going to read or whatever. Um, right. So, but I will say, better to have a record for reading a lot of books than to read zero. So, because you definitely get further ahead than if you're just not doing anything at all. So. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I mean, like my business grew and like, I feel, feel better about like life in general, like from reading the books yeah. versus, you know, maybe I was watching like more TV. Actually, I, I don't even right. know what I was doing instead, but like reading books, I'm like, I feel pretty good about that. So yeah, it's like time well spent. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, shifting gears, we'll, we'll, uh, wind down to a little banter section again. And, you know, Dave, you're running your own business now. You're a family man. I, I don't have any kids personally, but can you tell us just a little about your family? Like just so people get to know you a little bit? Yeah. Um, so I'm married. I have a wife, Katie. We've been married for nine years. Got three kids. Um, I got a five-year-old. Uh, a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a two-year-old. They're all about a year and a half apart, so depending on the month, you know, those would be the age differences. Um, we also did, or we do foster care, but we had a little girl with us for about nine months. Her name was Layla. She was like two, I think, or one and a half, or she had just turned one, actually. Uh, and she's actually being adopted by some friends of ours, and so she is now living with them. They're like her legal guardian. Um, but, uh, so that's cool. So we're, you know, waiting on basically wait on a phone call for you to watch another, uh, take another placement. So, but, uh, yeah, my kids are Brooks, Wesley, Nolan, a lot of energy, as you can imagine, they're all boys. Um, so my wife, uh, she was a nurse, but at the moment she stays home with all three of them, um, keeping them alive and, uh, not killing each other. So usually I'll come home and, and hang out. She was actually in Guatemala all last week on like a church missions trip thing. And so I was, basically staying home my mother-in-law came and helped out for a little bit so i could get some work in but i'll tell you what that is exhausting i don't know i don't know how she does that with them all the time um so but no that was that was fun so yeah so that's uh that's that's the fam and that's my life right now it's usually work from eight to six sometimes i'll take some of my boys out to lunch uh but then chill with them from about six to nine and then uh hang out with the wife after that right on that's cool. Yeah, that's great about the the foster um, care that you do. That's I, did, I had no idea. So it's oh, outstanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. I started doing that about a year ago. So. Okay, and like, did, how did you get involved in that? Just curious. Like, how, you were like, man, I don't, like, you know, I don't know. Um, I don't remember where we first heard about it, or uh, we had some friends who had done it, but I just you know, at least in our area, there's a huge need for it. I know nationally, there's like a huge need for good foster parents i know sometimes there's the stigma that's like ah oh, foster parents just do it for the money right like first off you don't get paid that much and, and what you do you pay is mostly because you're covering the cost of the kids groceries and buying a car seat and you know, all this stuff right um but uh but yeah i mean there's that stigma i guess some people do do it just for a paycheck and you hear some bad stories about that um so i'll say they need people there's a large need for good foster families just because you know, there's their kids. They're there. Usually not of their own fault, right? Their parents done something um, to put them in that situation, and so the kind of whole goal is to help the hope the parent kind of is able to get whether it's legal trouble or living conditions or whatever it was that the kid got pulled out of the family for, that they're able to kind of right the ship, and you can kind of help reunify that family, or if not, you know, give the kid a loving place until um, they can figure out their long term long-term plan but uh but yeah there's just a big need uh, there's just like a lot of kids that just didn't have literally anywhere anywhere to go and so um so like well shoot we got extra room you know let's right do it on. so we only take we only take um we were rec guided to only kind of someone said they've done it and they're like i if i were you i would only take kids that were younger than your youngest child just for some like just for sibling dynamics sometimes it creates weird risks not to say that everybody has to stick to that but we've kind of chosen to do that and it's we found that that's been a little bit uh made things a little bit smoother i guess you could say um so uh so yeah, no, it's been it you know obviously a little challenging here and there but it's a good rewarding experience nice that's pretty cool well um where can people find you dave if they want to connect with you or anything like that yeah um i'm probably the most active on instagram just david young dot xyz um 
I made an attempt to build out like a website. It was more like a personal website, but it kind of took the back burner to a lot of my other regular business stuff. So I do own the website, davidyoung.xyz as well. Um, that'll just kind of take you to a landing page. Um, you know, I've attempted to do like everybody, oh, I'll start a YouTube channel, put like three videos up, and then like, oh, that fizzled out. So, but I'm always on Instagram. So you can hit me up on Instagram or hit me on a DM there. Uh, I'm happy to chat, send chat with people time to time. They even set up like people have found me on other random podcasts and stuff and all. If they've got specific questions, I've hopped on calls with people for like 30 minutes here. They're just kind of give them some advice or, let them, you know, we can bounce ideas back and forth. So happy to try to set that up as I'm able. Um, but, but yeah. Cool. All right, man. Well, uh, good chatting with you today. Thanks for joining us on the Doug show. And um, yeah, we'll have you back on and we'll talk shop. Uh, we'll pick some other topic and just talk about it. So thanks, Dave. Sweet. Thanks, Doug. All right. Thanks again to Dave for joining me on this conversation and for taking the money laundering questions in stride. I'm not going to do any money laundering, but I'm just interested because they talk about it in TV shows all the time. All right. That's all for today. So we will catch you on the next episode. Have a great day out there. And oh, by the way, if you are not subscribed to the channel, have a look at some of the other videos. And if you like what you see, please do subscribe.